right, Logan, one thing we want to talk about today is the importance of stick involvement and keeping the pucks off your pads. And we're going to talk about stick angle, how far it should be gapped out. But first of all, let's have you drop here in your butterfly at the top of the crease for a second. So when we butterfly, when we get stick involvement, your stick's going to form an arc to go and meet the puck. And when we do this, it's a way to keep the puck off your pads. So when we talk about somebody jumping out of an airplane, they've got a big parachute, the main one, and the backup parachute. Your stick has got to be the main parachute. You use it all the time. In an emergency, we're not going to use it and it can hit your pads. Maybe if there's a deflector or a screen guy in front, then you're going to just leave your stick disciplined in the five hole. So show us a path of travel with your stick right now on a glove side low and then blocker side low. And by leaning your body over there, you got quite, quite the great range. Now, a couple problems we see with young goalies is when they bring the puck, the stick over to meet the puck, they have it tilted back like a nine iron. And any time a puck hits your stick and then goes into your body, it's gonna cause a bad rebound, so it's an error. So we don't wanna be making stick saves with a nine iron. We wanna be keeping it just tilted back just slightly like a three iron, so when we go meet it, it still elevates the puck to the corner, but it doesn't have the stick ramped back too far. Now, one other key problem I see when goalies are making stick involvement saves, particularly on the blocker side, is they'll let a puck, don't move your stick, come in, barely miss their stick blade, it will hit the pad and come over into a kill zone dangerous rebound, where all we needed to do was just a little three inch movement with the stick, and we got the puck elevated neatly to the corner. Now, one thing we'll watch with Logan is when you lean your body into the stick save, you can get range even past your butterfly and still keep that puck elevated in a safe position. We're gonna demonstrate a couple low shots here. And one thing we wanna have you do is we're gonna demonstrate pristine stick involvement, and then we'll walk you through some of the other things. So I want you just to line up Logan on angle right over here. So Maddie, right here, you're gonna be nice flat ice shots to the short side. They're gonna be short side shots. And I want you to get your stick involved on these if you can. Okay, to the glove side low now. To the glove side, glove side low. Last one. Perfect. Now, let's go over to the pucks on this side, Matt. And now, we're not gonna be allowed to use the stick, just your pads. And I'm gonna have you over here, Rossi. If you get a rebound on this side, I want you to cork it in. So now, we're gonna demonstrate what happens. The first error, when you don't use your stick on blocker side low shots, and we'll see what the issue is with what problem you create. Three more exactly like that. Perfect. Puck right back in the kill zone. That's going to bite you in the butt for sure later. Three more like that. Good battle. Good battle. Two more. Last one. All right. We can clearly see the problem created when we don't get stick involvement. So the last error we're gonna demonstrate here, I want you to artificially do this, exaggerate it. Tilt that stick back and get it involved, but lean it way back like it's a nine iron. You can shoot middle of the net, far side, wherever you want, but lean that stick way back. So that hit your stick and your pad, caused a greasy rebound. Not bad, last one. All right. Great job today, Logan. And let's remember, let's get our stick involved wherever possible on perimeter shots where there's no traffic. Let's not tilt it back like a nine iron. Let's keep that puck, that stick almost vertical. And let's neatly get all those pucks safely in the corner. Right, Logan, we survived on the ice today.
Great job. Loved how you're tracking the puck. Loved how you were following rebounds. Hungry on the loose pucks. Love the stuff we did. But I wanted to talk to you. Now you finally made Junior B. Of years of trying and just battling and proving people wrong. And I wanted to talk about some of the, the pregame stuff you do to prepare to play when you play junior. So when do you get to the rink? How soon before the game? Uh, I usually get to the rink about two hours before the game. Right. And two hours is pretty much standard. What do you do once you arrive at the rink, say it's a home game? What, what's your first couple options of what you do when you arrive? Uh, immediately I get in my warm up gear, so like shorts and uh, Under Armour shirt. Then I go to uh, tape my stick. Then after taping my stick, I go sit on the bench and just look around, just chill for a little bit, warm up my eyes, whatnot. And then after that, we usually have a team meeting, which lasts about 15, 20 minutes. And after that, I uh, get some racquetballs, throw them off the wall, get my hands and eyes warmed up, and then we go right into a team warm up off ice and kick the soccer ball around. And then after that, I just go and get, get dressed and get ready to go on the ice for a warm up. So, a lot of stuff happening there. Yeah. When you talk about arriving at the rink and going out to the bench, we see a lot of NHL goalies do that. Yeah. Where they'll sit there, they'll adjust their eyes to the lighting in the arena, get a, a sense of the arena if it's not a home game. And use the eye movement, sort of like Hellebuck or Holtby, or what are you actually doing with your eyes when you're on the bench in the pregame? Uh, I usually stick with I, uh, our bench is in the middle of the ice, so I'll look at the face-off dots, just start my eyes around back and forth. Uh, look at different markers on the boards and uh, try to read stuff far away, look up close, adjust in close and far. That's good to get the eyes warmed up. Another thing that's also good to do in that environment when you're sitting on the bench is assess the lighting, is there any dark zones on the ice. Yeah. Also, I would look over at the Zamboni doors, yeah. see if there's any goofy stuff going on there, um, get a sense if it's a normal size rink or if there's anything off at the angles. Yeah. So now you got your eyes warmed up out on the bench, you go back to a quiet area and you do some work with the racquetball. Tell us more about what you do with the racquetball. Uh, I start with just basic throwing it back and forth and then I'll do two balls at the same time and then after that I bounce it off the floor and then off the wall so it's kind of coming up at me, kind of like puck trajectory. And then after that I uh, do like alternating hands but I'm looking at the ball the whole time when I throw it, it comes up back off the wall. So it kind of simulates a low high pass. Right, so you're getting your eyes tracking the puck ball off the wall all the way into your hand and that's a yeah. great um, practice after the concentration going. Yeah. And do you do a, a set of specific goalie dynamic static type stretching away from the team beyond what you do with the team environment? Yeah, so after I'm warmed up with the team and we do all the basic stuff, I get into more of uh, mobility and resistance band stuff in my hips and my groin to make sure I'm ready to go, mostly injury prevention stuff. And just making me feel good before I get on the ice. Do you do any foam rolling or do you any, at any time doing that? Yeah, a little bit of foam rolling, mostly lacrosse ball, my feet, and my, uh, my glutes. All right, now we'd spoken earlier about how you manage your arousal level. It's not what you think arousal level, but arousal level refers to an athlete showing up either in a dopey, not ready to play, like maybe you're on a long bus ride to get to a yeah. game or something, and you show up in the rink and you're not feeling really sharp. So in that circumstance, what are some mental tricks or cues you do to recognize A, I'm dopey, and B, how can I get myself to be more alert and in, in the moment? Uh, before games, when I'm in the room, definitely music. Uh, and then closer to game time, maybe like warm up or right before a puck drop, it's a lot of breathing. If I feel lethargic, I'll uh, breathe quicker, get my heart rate up. And uh, it's also a visualization, just visualizing saves and sounds and whatnot and try to get pumped up a bit. And I think that's a, a great point because your body from a physiological point of view, once you increase purposely your heart rate by breathing, yeah. it does get you to the point where you're going to be a lot more alert. Now, alternatively, we've all been at games where we're getting ready and we're super nervous, we're too jacked up. So instead of being low, we're too jacked up. And in that circumstance, how do you bring things back to a, a more calm, successful arousal level? Uh, that's that's all breathing for me, just slowing my heart rate down and having some uh, some sayings I just say to myself, calm myself down, like just watch the puck or let the puck hit me, stuff like that. Now, when you're in a game, we all get scored on, good goal, bad goal, whatever. What is your post-goal routine? What do you do once you get scored on? 
Uh, try to think about it for about five seconds, assess what went wrong and how to, how to fix it next time and then just forget about it and just act like nothing happened and get ready for the next shot. I'm going to throw a few scenarios at you and you tell me mentally how you handle this. First period, you've had one shot on net. It's been about 10 minutes of game time before you, you haven't even stopped the puck in 10 minutes. How do you keep yourself alert when you've had a lull in the play? Uh, I try to stay in the moment. So I'll, I'll ask myself questions, say the plays in the other end. I'll be like, what number? Or uh, what hand is number 21? And then just think about lefty and uh, in between whistles, just keeping my legs moving, doing a little bit of crease movement. and. Keep, he keeps saying those affirmations to keep focused and know what I need to focus on when the puck comes to my end. Nice. Now, earlier we talked about what happens when you get scored on, you do that critical self-analysis for about five seconds and then reboot the hard drive and get up and out again. Yeah. How do you uh, approach your physicality after you get scored on? Are you a stick banger? Do you show emotion? Or what's your feeling on that? How do you approach it when you get scored on with respect to that? Yeah, I try to... Uh, whether I make the save or not, I just act the same, act like nothing happened. So if I get scored on, I, I react the same as if I had made the save. So that way I keep level-headed. It's another common game situation that we've all been through. You got a shutout going all game, two minutes to go. How many times have we thrown away a shutout? Normally it's a piece of crap goal. Yeah. What's your mindset in a game when you start leaking down on the clock to the last couple of minutes, you know you got a shutout going, how can you prevent yourself from getting distracted by the potential shutout? Uh, well, other than not thinking about it, because that's kind of inevitable, I try to just think that I've let in a goal already and that that pressure kind of goes away once you convince yourself that you have nothing to worry about. It's just a game. Just focus like advice, on the win. That sounds like advice a smart guy would have given you. Yeah. Like. yeah. I love the mental approach. I love the, uh, the pregame preparation. And let's talk about one other factor too is how consistently is your pregame preparation? Is it always the same? Does it vary? What's your thoughts on that? Uh, it, it varies sometimes depending on whether it's a road game. Like sometimes things happen and you don't always get there at the same time. So it's important to have a routine but not be superstitious with it. So like some stuff you gotta be okay to change or else it's gonna throw you off and it shouldn't. So yeah, it definitely varies. Sometimes I'll even change it up just to Try to throw myself off to make sure I don't get too, too uh, superstitious. That's a good idea, and that's a great point that not being married to your superstitions, yeah. um, being consistent with your preparation, but not going to be completely thrown off if you know the bus arrives late or yeah. something went on a broken skate or whatever. Now yeah. let's leave on this note: um, when you're backing up versus when you're a starter, does that change your preparation? And what are you thinking about mentally when you're on the bench as the game's progressing? so that if you did get in, you're not a bag of hammers. Yeah, it, it doesn't really change much for physical preparation. I, I just do the same thing, make sure I'm ready if I have to go in. But mentally, yeah, a little bit more relaxed and just trying to be a good teammate. That's great, and I love to hear that because a lot of times backup goalies and starting goalies, goalie partners can have a, a relationship with some underlying animosity, like you sort of, when the other guy gets scored, I'm like, yeah, yeah. take that. But I've always found there's something called hockey karma. And if you're supportive of your goalie partner, it's not hurting your career, your path through hockey. So I always found that when you're supportive and honest congratulations and hoping they do well, it tends to help you play better as well. And there is such a thing as karma, and I believe in that. So thanks for taking the time to speak with us today, Logan. Yeah. And thanks for working hard at the lesson today. And hopefully the, the people that watch this will take some of your tips and apply it to their games so that they can play at the levels that you're playing at. I'm sure we'll see you in Division I college hockey in the States very soon. Thank you. Thank you.